Thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's an honor as well um, to be speaking with the likes of the ones who spoke today. Um, today's topic is primarily data and intelligence and how businesses are leveraging uh, leveraging them and how it is making a huge impact in our own lives, right? So let's start with what is intelligence, right? Today you saw a plethora of speakers talking about right from human activism to um, you know sports to all kinds of things. So broadly, what we are doing in our lives is uh, we have an end goal, um, which can be defined by very simply Abraham Maslow's um, hierarchy of needs, right from physiological, which is food, for clothing, shelter, things like that, all the way to self-actualization, which is to reach our true potential self. We have the end goal. Now we need to find a way to learn that process. So we are continuously in the process of taking actions in an environment and gets us the feedback and we continuously learn to learn. And that's what humans do, right? We are so good at it and we are continuously evolving. Now, if you look at this process, so there are a whole bunch of intelligence that we could see today. Spatial intelligence is equivalent of, you know, excelling at sports. Languages, language and communication is equivalent to TED Talks. Um, knowledge representation, reasoning and logic is equivalent to what science is doing today. Emotional intelligence, connecting with other people in the world and trying to collaborate and coordinate in a, in a society which we, in which we can all progress really well. Creativity, we saw today one of the presentations on design, right? That's the that sheer creativity in the process. Ethics, how we can work morally in, in this society and make best of everyone's lives. Uh, consciousness, which is something that every human has or every animal, in fact, has it. And the whole process is that, you know, there's also a huge argument in terms of whether AI is really going to get consciousness or not in the future, which is called singularity. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, so what's happening in the real world is um, humans are limited by certain aspects, right? One is primarily the time. We live only certain um, years and we have uh, limited compute power and we have limited uh, in terms of scale as well. We can only process so much data. Now, other aspect is if you look at uh, the way humans function, we have a whole bunch of cognitive biases. Right, and a whole variety of biases have been identified. That's primarily because we are not able to process all the data in the world, right, to to, uh, to begin with. And there is not the energy which we cannot understand. A simple fact like uh, compounding um, money growing exponentially is difficult for us to invest in. So we tend instead of investing in stocks, we may end up investing in something like land which grows at 10%. So that's that's part in it's in, innate in our process. The the reason being very simple, right? Um, we can only do so much. Now, computer science in primarily defines many different problems. Uh, if you look at the problem space, very simple is a polynomial algorithm, right? Um, we want to find the shortest path between from home to your workplace, right? There could be many different roads, but it's as simple as that, but it's it's still a difficult problem to solve for humans, right? Over many years, we'll probably figure out the right way to get to our workplace. Uh, the second big problem is non-polynomial, right? Which is uh, take an integer, a big integer, and try to break it down into the smallest integer possible. That's also a difficult problem for humans. Right, and the next big problem is knapsack problem. Right, a very simple example is a thief goes tries to steal somebody's home, and there is a whole bunch of things like you know jewelry, cars, furniture, things like that. But there is only so much option that you can pick up. Let's say let's put a constraint on that and say this is the only thing you can pick up, right, based on the weight and the volume. Right, so you know, the thief finds it really hard to make decisions and pick up the most valuable item with the limited amount of weight that he can carry back. Right, so these are problems that computer science can really solve very well. Another important problem is traveling salesman. So if you have 10 cities to visit and you want to find without visiting any other city in the world, in, in those 10 cities, you can just find the most optimal route. That's a very hard problem. That's 10 factorial, which is a huge number in, in millions, right? So uh, there are only two equations in the entire slide. So I don't want to bog you guys down with the thing. The first one is called optimizer. Uh, it's an example of a stochastic gradient algorithm. And every problem in AI is pretty much boils down to this equation, right? The second uh, important problem, is, the second important equation is entropy. What does this mean? So if we want to add some data which improves our value, net value of the problem that we are solving for, and that is called information gain. And if it adds value, that's when the data is really useful. So these are two equations that will repeat itself throughout the process. Now, uh, we are not as bad as we think we are. We are good at some uh, some exceptional things like abil ability to recognize somebody's face, right, very easily. You might have seen that person 10 years back, but you will still be able to recognize, go back and recognize the same thing. Uh, in terms of the human gait, uh, you must have seen Pragya presenting herself at triathlon, right? This is only possible because our bodies are evolved over millions of years and we are able to excel at these points. So let's let's do a very simple exercise, okay? I just want to um, want you to try this out and see the you know the possibilities that humans can do. Keep looking at the target and shake your head left to right without 
without moving your head and then up and down and you can rotate as well, right? So very simply, if you observe, your eyeball stays constant, right? Your eyeball is staying constant no matter what kind of movement you do with the target, right? Let's go back and try this again, right? Sorry. Back. So, what, what, what we did was basically keep the eyeball stable irrespective of the movement of the head. So, this is basically enabled because we have a sensor in our own body called vestibular system in which we are able to pretty much um, find the acceleration and the tilt of the head and the brain is able to compensate for the movements of the head itself. That is going back into the eye muscles and we, we try to replicate this process in the robot. This was uh, back in 20, 2006 when we presented the work and said, okay, if we are able to mimic this thing, uh, we will be able to reproduce it. So this, it's part of a, a math problem plus a machine learning algorithm which can try to compensate both visually and at the same time uh, math, uh, with, the, with the vestibular system as well. So we were able to do that. And then the whole process is that, you know, humans are so good at it, but we are finding it so difficult to imitate the same thing in robots. Now coming to the point of data, right, as uh, Spash was just saying, there's an exponential growth in terms of the social media, right, and uh, by 2025, we will be able to process somewhere around 463 exabytes, which is 10 raised to 18 um, gigabytes, literally, right? So the whole process is, the, the technology is evolving so fast. Uh, back in uh, 1821, we were just trying to attempt to do math using analytical engine. And then we went on to, um, you know, uh, create vacuum tubes uh, back in 1946. And all of a sudden, we are in a deep learning age where we can process up to five petaflops of, uh, you know, information in a single machine itself, in a single box. Right. So, so what's happening is the businesses are trying to figure out what is the best way humans can optimize uh, our own lives and how we are able to achieve that. And it's touched everybody's lives already, right? If you look at your wearables, your phones, your uh, laptops, your everyday affairs, right from getting up and all the way to sleeping, um, we have been impacted, right? And why is that? Because primarily businesses are focusing on optimizing everything possible, right? Right from prospecting, that is getting uh, customers to buy the product that, you know, you like, and moving on to customer onboarding, which is primarily doing KYC, whether it is compliance, and a lot of, uh, you know, um, onboarding activities and uh, engagement, right? Do you, are you satisfied with the product? Are you happy with the product? What kind of product issues are you facing? How can we service you with, uh, you know, all kinds of chatbots and things like that, right? And finally, customer retention. Uh, you know, what is your behavior in terms of using the product? Are you going to really attract to some other competitor? Are you going to buy some other product and instead of, you know, let go of the existing product that you have? So all these things have been thought through by the businesses day in and day out. Right, and that's basically using the data. Now let's take the example of uh, the world of finance. Right, so the first thing we did in finance was, uh, what is the uh, what is the most important thing in finance? So we want to reap, uh, we want to impact the, both the bottom line and the top line of the businesses. Right. So let's take an example of a lending bank. And what happens if you lend so, uh, to someone who is low risk? Right. Um, that means he's an affluent guy and uh, he wants to pay lower interest rates. Right, so he's not very profitable to be honest. Although he can, we can lend him a lot of money. On the other hand, we want to, if you want to lend to someone who's very risky, there's another aspect to it, right? If if you're there, then there is a possibility that you may even lose money in the process because the person may never pay back. So there is this middle section. If you look at this curve, bell curve, the middle section is where you're really most interested in, which is the most profitable area in the business, right? That's called a sweet spot, right? And this is where we are trying to optimize the risk versus reward. And anything on either side of the bell curve is not so profitable. Sometimes it ends up being in, uh, in loss. So this is applicable to pretty much every application in finance, be it portfolio management, lending, capital allocation, diversification, or stress testing, right? Um, so in each of these scenarios, we really want to optimize uh, the most risk versus reward benefit, right? Moving on to marketing, right? This is, these are the two sectors. If I, if I truly speak, AI yeah, has hit its maximum potential in finance and marketing. The marketing is another aspect where it touches every part of uh, the marketing aspect, which is product, pricing, promotion, and price, uh, the place itself, right? And uh, Nier is excelling in the, that primarily because of all these um, um, aspects, including, let's begin with a simple example of audience segmentation. If you have a product and you want to you maximize 
the potential of you know you want to uh, find a cohort of people that you want to go and sell the product to right and that is what is truly audience segmentation and this is all ai built in which is trying to maximize the value for that product the second aspect is product personalization right not everybody likes to buy the same product or the same car or the same um, you know phone everybody has their own uh, uh, you know means and ways they have a personality for which the product is suitable and that's what is product personalization truly and the other aspect that marketing is always focused on is maximizing the customer lifetime value that means once a customer always a customer is the process if if you want to get a customer get him for life that is the motto right and uh, you want to find those customers who are going to be with you all throughout your journey and in the process what's what's happening is you are trying to spend a lot of money in marketing which is acquisition cost and you want to minimize that acquisition cost which is very expensive as of today with the social media and everything and you want to maximize the customer lifetime value as well so these are important aspects and and there's a whole bunch of things right with regard to digital advertising which is ad bidding right ad bidding is has become so technologically advanced that it's all happening in microseconds it's almost like a stock market where you're trying to bid for an ad and you're you're trying to find out which is the best person to bid what is the best price to bid and what not right uh, anomaly detection uh, fraud fraud is a great example of you know do we really want to bid against an ad which is a fraud bid right so that's another aspect of it seasonality trends when do we bid so that you know the customers can go and spend and you know promote your product that that's another aspect so product pricing right if you price it right the people will end up buying the product if you price it wrong then people most likely will not buy the product so every aspect of the product is touched primarily in the marketing so it's it's super important that you leverage ai in every possible field over there and there's a huge amount of data to process this what is the future of uh, data and intelligence right so we'll move to that section which is primarily um, i'll talk about uh, first what is artificial general intelligence and what we have been doing uh, in up till 2010 and between 2010 and 2020 so when we started machine learning it was purely called supervised learning that means somebody would stick a label and say this person is a affluent customer right and then affluent customer would have certain behavior and and you would stick another label saying this is not so affluent or not interested in certain product and stick a label right that was how we would do machine learning back in 2010 and slowly things have evolved in such a way that you know labeling itself is such a costly affair we want to focus on primarily what is the best way to train a model a model is something like a machine which tries to learn all the behaviors of the people without labeling um in the process so that's where we are heading towards and no no longer in the future right just like humans do we don't have a label right somebody is not coming and telling us okay this person is so and so this person is so and so right we are constantly learning from the data itself and that's what unsupervised learning is all about and where we are trying to learn the inherent distribution of the data right and then try to figure out okay these are the group of people who belong to offline group or not so offline group or someone who likes the product or who doesn't like the product uh, personalization recommendation all kinds of problems right so unsupervised learning is taking off in a big way in deep learning some good examples are auto encoders and gans if you guys are interested you should go and check out some of the details about that um, in 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 depth the second aspect is self supervised learning i think this is a big proponent where facebook is trying to work towards and a lot of it a lot of applications it has found itself in computer vision right so one of the things is very simple like if you uh, do a captcha they will try to tell you um click on all the um traffic uh, you know pictures right in captcha before that you you, know, you do want to prove yourself that you're not a robot that's a classic example of a self supervised learning where you're trying to put all the images of certain type in a in a set and that becomes your label in a way and you are able to train yourself from the data so a part of the data itself is a label and some part of it is actually the data that you need to learn the model needs to learn and you will end up classifying two different aspects of it right so this is this is coming up to be another uh, revolutionary um, uh, seminal paper the transfer learning is is where where you have one problem which has lot of data available already but in some cases you don't have data at all right so you would learn from one set of data and apply it to another problem where there is no data which is a good example is zero shot learning or few shot learning where you have very small amount of data for us to learn learn from so you would learn from a lot of data and apply it to another and then you will end up doing classification or regression or whatever problems you want to right the final um, thing is reinforcement learning the beauty of this is that um, you are doing learning by trial and error method that's another way humans do 
we continuously do trials and errors in the process and we learn from the environment itself and do a feedback. And reinforcement learning uh, is primarily used in examples like ad bidding, right? Where we're trying to figure out what is the best price to bid at, uh, what is the most optimization, and you know, we apply Nash equilibrium into the problem and try to figure out what is the uh, right uh, price to bid at and which, which ad to bid at, right? And this is in summary all these uh, technologies that are coming up in the future. Uh, finally, we, uh, Professor Suji talked a lot about Web 3.0. So I'll touch upon it as to how we can create Web 3.0 because everything that is in the Web 3.0 will be affected by artificial intelligence. So back in 2011, we built, um, uh, we built a 3D world uh, using cameras, uh, which is basically Kinect cameras, and we use laser uh, devices for getting the depth, the color from the cameras and the depth from the things, and we were able to uh, present, uh, uh, there's a problem called pose estimation where you're trying to merge one frame with respect to the next frame, right? It's all 3D affair. So it's a very intensive process. A lot of computer science, uh, you know, graphics, especially computer graphics is involved. So if somebody is interested in Web 3.0, they should take a look at what graphics is about, how we are doing 3D pose estimation, and how we are building SLAM, which is localization and mapping. I, I think these are three problems that will come up in a big way. And everything else uh, that, that we did with marketing will also come in play because there will be social media, there will be NFTs, there will be uh, Bitcoins and all kinds of technologies in, in Web 3.0. So primarily we need to have virtual reality in the first place to get started with. right? And it's a massive effort by everybody in the world if we want to get to Web 3.0. And I believe it should not be owned by corporations. It, be, it should be owned publicly by every one of us here in this group so that nobody has control over Web 3.0, which is, which is what we want to go after uh, you know, um, in the world. So uh, finally, uh, ethical AI. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, negative, um, you know, bashing in social media. Privacy, um, you know, privacy is an important aspect. So there are two different uh, frameworks for it. One is federated learning. For example, I wear a watch, and we could learn the the information from my watch itself and send whatever I have learned from my watch back into the server, so that I don't have to send my private information to the central server itself. So the machine learning model resides on my watch itself. And homomorphic encryption is another um, aspect where we are already uh, doing math on the encryption um, and encrypted data. So these are two problems that, uh, you know, two ways to solve uh, ethical AI. And there's a lot of information uh, online, so you can take a look at those two things. And uh, there are new frameworks coming. One is knowledge graph, and the second one is automated machine learning, where everything, right, from feature engineering all the way till automated insights uh, will be put in place. So with all these technologies, right, within 20 minutes, I can never cover the whole AI, but I've I given you a brief idea about what AI is going to be. I think AI is not about building, putting consciousness into the machines, but I think it's an extension of what human intelligence is about. And we are going to be in a much better place because a lot of work that we are doing on a day-to-day -day basis will be delegated in the back end. And we will be focused on what we really need to do and what we are intending to do in the future. So thank you very much.